أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله today we are going to do our session number 13 and it's called as what is my reaction towards hardship in life so as we proceed let's do a quick recap of whatever we have covered so far so so far we have covered the topics of health how important our health is if our physical health is messed up then of course what happens it has an impact on our relationships right if our relationships are messed up then it leads to stress mental exhaustion and depression in short our emotional well-being when it's affected subhanallah our entire uh, our entire time is spent on the fact she said this and he said this and i responded to them like this and subhanallah the end result is that there is no productivity right our mind revolves around all these negative thoughts all the time and as a result of it family matters are affected so then there is rivalry between parents and children husband and wife amongst siblings relatives and our entire life is just gone it's just spent um just revolving around these issues right another important element in our life is haya modesty and we spoke about this as well that and haya is an entire demeanor which includes our dress code and character so when we lack modesty and go against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that too affects our relationships, right? What happens is that parents keep doubting their children. They feel that they cannot trust them anymore. Suspicion flares up between husband and wife because they feel that their marital rights are being compromised. All this leads to unintended stress, right? So how can we avoid it? By following the criteria of haya, right? By abiding by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by following the Quran and sunnah. So all these rules and regulations, whether it's uh, mandating hijab, it may seem overwhelming for us at times, right? But subhanAllah, it in fact is for our own benefit. It protects us from so many problems that may arise as a repercussion of that, as a consequence of that sinful behavior. So our physical health and emotional health in turn affects our spiritual well-being as well, right? When we are not physically healthy or when we are emotionally unhealthy, when we are upset, what happens, subhanAllah, our spiritual health gets affected as well. So then there's no focus on our ibadah. We are unable to concentrate in our salah. There's no time to recite the Quran. And as a result of it, everything is messed up. Our home is not a blessed home anymore. Rather, it's a home full of problems, afflictions, and trials, right? So then what happens, we start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We start saying, why am I tested like this? Why my home is not a happy home like others? Why do I have to go through such calamities in life? But what we tend to forget is that sometimes we ourselves are responsible responsible for the problems we face sometimes life throws tests at us towards us right but a lot of times we have a role to play as well but what do we do instead we blame everything on qadr we blame everything on the decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so subhanallah before we question the decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and proceed with the list of complaints let's question ourselves what am i doing wrong where do i need to fix myself right 
And you have these points that we have covered so far in different lectures, in different episodes, right? So just assess yourself, question yourself, where I need to fix myself. Is it my diet? Is it my attitude towards others? Is it my lack of knowledge about my creator? Is it my lack of sensitivity towards the feelings of others? Is it the choice of my friends who are inciting me towards sins? What is it? Is it something related to Haya, modesty? Right? We need to ask these questions ourselves. We need to pinpoint fingers at ourselves rather than others in order to assess ourselves. And regarding this, there's a very beautiful narration by Umar radiallahu an, um, who was Umar radiallahu an, he was the second Khalifa of Islam. And he used to say, hold yourselves accountable before you are held accountable. And evaluate yourselves before you are evaluated. Because the reckoning will be easier upon you tomorrow on the day of Qiyamah, if you hold yourselves accountable today. And subhanAllah, if you think about it, these are so true words, such true words indeed, right? Life consists of different types of tests. Life consists of different type of events. There are incidents in which we play a major role. And when they mess up, we are to blame. It's our fault. We are responsible for it. But then there are matters where we have no control over, right? So inshallah, as we are heading towards the completion of our Blessed Home series, let's talk about the things that are beyond our control, right? So in today's session, let's address the topic of how do we address calamities as believers? What should be our response to hardships and trials? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ayah number two of Surah Mulk, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, Bismillahi rahman rahim الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور. Allah سبحانه وتعالى says he is the one who has created death and life so that he may test you which of you is best indeed. So in this ayah of Quran, Allah سبحانه وتعالى tells us that he has created life and death. In order to test us. Test us with what? To see who amongst us performs good deeds. What does it tell us? That life is not always going to be smooth. It cannot only comprise of happiness. There will be sadness too, right? Every phase of life will not be filled with success. At times, there will be failures too. Each and every moment will not be based upon accomplishments. There will be challenges too. Every person in the world will not be pleased with us. At times, there will be criticism as well. So in moments of happiness as believers, what should be our attitude? We should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For instance, if we get good grades in class, alhamdulillah, we should tell ourselves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me success. But in case, if we do not achieve the desired result as believers, what should be our reaction? We shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't take it in a negative manner saying, that's it, I'm not trying anymore, I know I am a loser, I'm so dumb, I cannot achieve anything in life. No, we should take this hardship as an opportunity to improve ourselves, study more, and accomplish better grades next time, inshallah. And there is a, a quotation by Albert Einstein, who said, failure is success in progress. So anytime you fail, anytime you are unable to achieve your target, 
just tell yourself failure is success in progress meaning you are proceeding towards success you are proceeding towards your goal so just keep trying and do not lose hope now this was just an example to make you understand however when we talk about hardship when we talk about calamities each calamity is based upon different intensity right some people go through severe hardship and some people do not it happens right so what do we do in such situations for instance there are people living in war zones and they go through traumatic life incidents it's a huge trial right alhamdulillah we're not faced by all that but there are people like that who are living in war zones right while others may not go through such a hardship but they may go through abusive relationships for some their spouse their family members they can become a trial right they can become a source of hardship they can become a mode of test for them while for others their friends can become a mode of test fitna for them right so it happens with each one of us because life is not perfect and this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us in the Quran that the reason why he has created death and life is so that he can test us that who amongst us do the best of deeds who amongst us keep on trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is the basic purpose of our life so when we talk about life life is full of trials we all go through different forms of tests in different phases of life but none of us are protected from it right the intensity may be different but subhanallah each one of us are tested in one way shape or form and we see these instances around us all the time so what's the learning for us as believers as believers we should always make dua for afia for khair for goodness for health we should always make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from fitan and trials but in case if a calamity strike us we should learn to be patient we should make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us out to face this calamity plus we should try to seek the best medical treatment for it and then rest the case if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and why is that so because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al alim he is the one who knows what's best for us he is the one who's the most knowledgeable so he knows what is khair for us at what point of time so now even though there are different forms of tests right but inshallah today we are going to zoom in one aspect of life a form of test which basically strikes all of us and what is it sickness right illness ailment so let's take the example of illness why is that so because we all fall sick isn't it some of us recover alhamdulillah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that staying alive is better for us so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us health so that we can do more good deeds more hasana inshallah while some of us when we fall sick we do not recover from the sickness and we die and even if that's the case we shouldn't question the decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that i made so many duas allah did not hear my duas why am i going through death why did none of my duas work out we shouldn't question the decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because even in that case just remember allah is al -Adeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that in this case death is khair for me death is khair for us 
Wallahu alam. Had we stayed alive, maybe the illness would proceed so much, it would intensify so much that perhaps it would become unbearable for me to bear. It would become unbearable for me to endure, right? So maybe that's why Allah destined death for me. Or perhaps had we stayed alive, we would have indulged in a sinful activity and harmed our akhirah, harmed our hereafter. So alhamdulillah, wherever Allah decides for us, we may not, we may not like it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that it's good for us. It's khair for us. And that is the kind of attitude we should have, inshallah. So in today's class, we will be focusing on the topic of sickness. How do we face reality if we are diagnosed with any kind of illness? And how do we take care of our loved ones if they fall sick? And why are we addressing this particular topic only? Because this is a common sort of test that we all face, right? Whether we are young or old, whether we are um, Muslims or non-Muslims, everyone faces this kind of test, right? We all fall sick at some point of life. So when afflicted with an illness, what happens? We usually become distressed. We complain, we use negative words, we curse the doctors and all the mental health institutions. But the fact of the matter is, is what we don't realize is that sickness is a powerful blessing in disguise. What's the proof? How do we know this? Let's take a look at the following hadith. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he visited a female companion by the name of Ummi Sa'id. And why did he visit her? Because she was suffering from fever. So she had a lot of fever, intense fever, and she was in severe pain. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to visit her. And since she was in pain out of discomfort, she kept tossing and turning. And she, she said, I have a severe fever. May Allah curse it. So basically, she's cursing the fever, right? And subhanAllah, fever is something which is intangible. Like, how can you curse it, right? But the effect of our negative words may not actually have an impact on the fever, but it will have an impact on us, on our book of deeds. That's why we should always use positive words, not negative words. So listening to that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded to her by saying, do not curse the fever, for verily it forgives sins like a furnace gets rid of the impurities in iron. Now let's analyze this example. What happens when you put an iron into the furnace and it is full of impurities? What happens? It goes through a rigorous process, right? And once that process is over and you take it out, it comes out 100% pure. All its impurities are gone. They're washed away, right? Similarly, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us that fever acts in this manner as well, in a similar manner as well. So when we fall sick or if we suffer from anything as minute as a fever, the good news is that alhamdulillah, it helps us to burn our sins. The fever, which was perhaps... 100 degree or 101 Fahrenheit, it helps us invite the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a big deal. So no matter whatever it is, any pain, discomfort that you're going through, whether it's a fever, whether it's a pain in your ankle, anything it is, just remember to stay patient and anticipate the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoid using anything negative, inshallah. So what should be the attitude of a believer when we fall sick? Rather than cursing the fever, we should 
use optimism. So that's key number one. We should say, Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it an atonement for me so that I am forgiven. Many a time, subhanAllah, we commit sins upon sins upon sins, but we forget to say Astaghfirullah. We forget to seek the forgiveness of Allah. We ignore seeking the maghfira of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We ignore, we delay, we undermine, we just delay. So anytime when we fall sick, use it as an opportunity that inshallah, may this fever be, may this illness be an atonement for me so that I am forgiven, so that my sins are forgiven right? So any words of complaints or negativity should be avoided because this is the time when you're very close to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the time when your du'as are accepted. This is the time when your request is granted. So we have to use the right words. Try to avail this opportunity to make multiple du'as for yourself and for your family members because this is the time when you are truly close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is very close to you. His rahmah is very close to you. So you better avail this opportunity. Now the question is, is this true only for fever? Of course not. It applies to any misfortune, whether it's you suffering from a cough or cold, or say, for instance, when we accidentally cut our fingertip while chopping the onions, right? Anything can happen, right? Inshallah, all this can be a source of forgiveness of sins for us. Now, does this mean that we should wish for hardship? That, yeah, Allah, please make me come across a hardship. Make me come across a calamity. Of course not. We shouldn't ever make dua for a calamity, right? We should never ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a hardship. But in case, if a calamity afflicts us, then what's the cure? What's the remedy? That we should stay patient and submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should say, Qadar Allah, I submit to the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, it will be khair for me. Now, whether the sickness is temporary or permanent, it's important for us to know how to deal with it. For instance, at times people are diagnosed with ailments such as cancer and the like. That goes on for years, right? Not just for a month, not just for 10 months. It goes on for years. In that case, God forbid, if any one of us is afflicted with such a tribulation, may Allah protect us all. We should know what should be our reaction towards it as a Muslim. So what's the first thing we should say? Whether it's something as minute as a fever or whether it's something as, as serious as cancer. Any time when a calamity strikes us, we should say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, which means truly to Allah we belong and truly to Him we shall return. And subhanAllah, um, many a times we only use this statement when anyone passes away. Unfortunately, that is not the only time we say these words, right? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun can be said any time. Right? In the Sahaba, they would even say this when the electricity would go off. For them, what was electricity? Right? For them, the mode of electricity was the light that they would put on, the candle, right? The lantern that they would put on. So that fire, if it would extinguish for some reason because of wind or something else, they would say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Because for them, it's trouble. It's a problem. How are they going to navigate? How are they going to walk home? Right? How are they going to do their chores? Because it's pitch dark. There are no street lights. There are no flashlights. Right? So it was hardship for them. So what do we learn from that? That any time when we come across a problem, whether it's small or big, we should say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And face it with optimism, inshallah.
um, so that's the first thing to do. The next thing to do is to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope for his pleasure. According to a hadith, we come to know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a group of people, he tests them. Now think about it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, he is testing you. So alhamdulillah, it's a good news for you that anytime if you fall sick or if you're going through any kind of hardship, just tell yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me. That's why I am being tested, inshallah. Because subhanallah, many a times the scholars say that a person is destined to go to a certain level of Jannah, okay? But his deeds do not qualify him to reach that level. Perhaps he is destined to reach level 900 of Jannah, okay? But subhanAllah, he's not doing a lot of good deeds. He's not helping out a lot of people. He's not doing the deeds to please of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not spending much time to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that's the case, then at times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that person to become sick. He's diagnosed with a illness, with some life-threatening disease, so that he is able to reach that level of Jannah that was destined for, for him. But subhanAllah, he did not reach that level by doing enough hasanat. So this is one way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to elevate the darajat of this person. He wants to elevate the status of this person. So that's the reason why this person falls sick. Many a times when people come across their death at a very young age of 20 or 30, they feel very depressed, right? They feel that had I stayed alive longer, I could have done extra good deeds. Why did Allah do this to me, right? Why did this happen to me? But subhanAllah, what they don't realize is that perhaps the beautiful patients that they portray during their sickness period, during their illness period, that sabr, that patience may enable them to unlock <coughs> the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? SubhanAllah. So it's definitely khair for us. It's definitely good for us. So subhanAllah, what do we learn? That there is a lot of ajr for patience. For instance, we come to know from a prophetic hadith that when a believer becomes ill, the malaika, the angels say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O Arab, you have confined so and so. So servant of yours. Meaning what? That he's unable to get up. He's unable to stay active. He's unable to do all the things that he was able to do. So the malaika, they say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, you have confined the servant of yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to the malaika, record and seal for the servant the same amount of deeds that the servant used to do when he was not ill. Until the servant recovers from his illness or he passes away. Now, what does this mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, fairness, and justice, will tell the malaika, to record the same amount of good deeds. Because of course, we all know that there are angels on our shoulders who are recording our deeds all the time. They're documenting our deeds all the time, right? But say for instance, when we fall sick and we are motionless, we're not getting up, we're not helping others out, we're not doing anything, then the malaik are clueless. Ya Allah, what do we write? What do we do? Right? This person is sick. He's laying on the bed for so many months. What do we do? What do we write? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, he says to the malaika to record the same amount of good deeds for this person as he used to do when he was healthy. Meaning what? 
Meaning that if he used to get 80% reward for his salah during the time when he was healthy. And subhanAllah, I'm not saying 100% because we all know the state of our salah, right? It is not a 100% for sure, definitely. Maybe it was the level of the sahaba and maybe not because that would be the level of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But definitely our level of salah, our level of khushu, our level of attention in salah is definitely not 100%. So say for instance, it was 80% and I'm still exaggerating. SubhanAllah, our salah needs a lot of work, right? A lot of fixed thing to do. A lot of things need to be fixed in our salah, but astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us. But say for instance, if, you were able to do your salah and you did it beautifully that every single salah that you did deemed 80% reward. It brought you 80% of reward when you were healthy. Inshallah, during the phase of your sickness, despite the fact that our body is hurting, our back is aching, and the quality of our salah is lacking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still give us the same amount of ajr, which is 80%, like the way we used to perform when we were healthy. Subhanallah. This is the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, when we think about sickness, yes, definitely, it is tough being sick. No doubt, it's not easy, right? None of us enjoy illness. But subhanallah, through these ahadith, what do we learn? That there is a lot of ajr in it. Why is that so? Because it's a test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see how do we react during this phase. If we pass this test with flying colors, then beautiful is the aftermath of it. But if we complain, if we only use negative words. If we question the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then whose loss is it? Of course, our loss. Number one, we're suffering due to the sickness. And number two, we're not even receiving any ajr. We're not even receiving any reward. So there's no point in using all those negative words or cursing the fever, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no tiredness, exhaustion, worry, grief, distress, or harm befalls a believer in this world, not even a thorn that pricks him, but Allah expiates some of his sins thereby. Meaning what? That any mental stress that you go through, whether it's related to school or office, job or family, or any physical ailment that you are diagnosed with, any kind of exhaustion because of your schoolwork, because there was so much to do, anything that you face during the day, inshallah, if you and me, if we remain patient, then there is a lot of ajr, a lot of reward attached to it. SubhanAllah. And why is there so much ajr for patients? Because it's not just our reaction to sickness that we shouldn't complain. It also includes our treatment of others. So that leads us to point number three. Attitude of a believer when we fall sick. Another thing to keep in mind is to treat others well. Because generally what happens when we are going through a headache or we're suffering through some kind of pain, we tend to be harsh towards others, right? By default, we speak to them in a very rude and condescending manner. And if they do something wrong, we think it's our right to punish them. For instance, your mom or your child is trying to help you when you are sick. But accidentally, when she brings the glass of water with your medicine, she accidentally spills the glass of water. And as a default reaction, you yell or scream at her in order to release your frustration, isn't it? And it happens with all of us, each one of us. 
right? That when we are going through any kind of illness, it affects our emotional well-being. It makes us stressful. It just takes us towards a bad phase of life, right? We are not in a happy mood. We do not wish to talk to anyone. We just want to stay by ourselves. We just want to stay alone. And even if someone tries to talk to us, we are very grumpy. We're in a grumpy mood. So treating others with respect and compassion that's also something which is included in sabrun jamil and what is sabrun jamil beautiful patience and the more beautiful the patience is the more the reward for it inshallah and where did we hear this word sabrun jamil in the story of yusuf alayhi salam who used this word his father, Yaqub alayhi salam, he used the word sabrun jameel when he lost his son, Yusuf alayhi salam. And he was away from him for 30 plus odd years. SubhanAllah, that's a huge calamity, even though he was not physically sick. But the pain and the agony of being separated from his son was so much. The stress was so intense. That towards the end phase of his life, he lost his eyesight because of excessive weeping. He became blind. And blindness is a test on its own, is a calamity on its own, is a hardship on its own, right? SubhanAllah. So every single thing in our life is actually attached to each other, just like dominoes, right? The domino effect, it's just like that. When one gets messed up, the other thing gets messed up. The other thing gets messed up, all the other factors around it, they get messed up as well. SubhanAllah. So what's the key? Let's summarize all the points, right? So attitude of a believer when we fall sick. Number four, treatment with ruqya. And what is ruqya? To treat ourselves with Quran and prophetic supplications okay to use the quran and prophetic supplication so in order to sum up the points that we have covered so far number one we spoke about patience right number two being pleased with the qadr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acceptance and doing the best of deeds we can why is that so because time is precious health is valuable SubhanAllah, if we utilize these blessings today to use them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we are healthy, then inshallah, the angels will record the same amount of good deeds for us during tested times. But say, for instance, today when we have health, we do not pray. We do not recite Quran. We have no inclination to help others. We have no inclination to do good treatment of the poor and the needy. We do not give any charity or sadaqah. We like to hoard our wealth in order to spend all, all the money on ourselves. We have no inclination to respect others. We do not have any time to do deeds to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then imagine when we fall sick, subhanAllah, there's nothing actually that the angels can record. Right? Because there were no hasanat when we were healthy, then what would be there when we're sick? Right? So plan wisely. Now that we have health and time, and subhanAllah, you guys have youth too. You guys are young, mashaAllah. Use your health, your time, your youth to use it fi sabirillah, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that in case, in future, God forbid, if any one of us fall sick, and we are unable to move, we are unable to do hasanat, we're unable to do good deeds, inshallah, Allah will still reward us. Allah will still reward us based upon the hasanat we did when we were healthy, inshallah. Allahumma sta'an, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us. Amin. So number three, using the tools mentioned for shifa. So just like we mentioned treatment with Quran, or listening to it. That's a primary tool. And why are we mentioning this? Because many a times when people fall sick, what's the first thing they do? They abandon salah. They abandon praying their mandatory salah. SubhanAllah, this is against sabrun jamil. This is against, contrary to 
beautiful patience. Why should we skip salah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us the different ways of ease to perform salah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the easy way out that if we cannot stand and pray salah, we can sit down and pray salah, right? If the intensity of the pain is too much and we cannot even sit down and pray, then we can lay down and pray. But we still have to pray because this is an obligation upon us. SubhanAllah, even if we can try to pray only the fard salah, we should. And that takes hardly five minutes, right? SubhanAllah, it doesn't take much time. But there's no excuse to abandon salah by saying that, okay, I have a headache. I have a headache, I cannot pray salah. I have a fever, I cannot pray salah. I feel exhausted and tired. Okay, fine, I'm going to skip salah. No, there is no excuse to skip salah. Other than the fact that if someone is unconscious, subhanAllah, then of course, he doesn't have to pray salah. Because, subhanAllah, he has a valid excuse. So, subhanAllah, praying salah is actually helpful during sickness. Many people abandon salah during their sickness. But what do we learn here? That praying salah is actually beneficial during sickness. Why is that? Because Allah subhanahu wa tells us in the Quran that Quran is shifa for us. Surah Fatiha is shifa for us. So when we recite Fatiha in every single raka, guess what? It's actually acting as a mode of shifa for you, as a use of medicinal, um, you know, treatment for you. When we recite some portion of the Quran after Fatiha, again, subhanAllah, it's a mode of healing for you. It's a mode of healing for us. So subhanAllah, Praying salah is actually beneficial for us. And other than salah also, when we are sick, we should try our best to listen to the recitation of Quran because it is shifa in its entirety. So why stay deprived from it? And of course, another tool of shifa is to recite the du'as that are taught to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there are multiple du'as. You can, inshallah, download the app and recite it. Or subhanAllah, if you do not have strength because you have fever and you cannot um, recite too much because you're feeling tired and exhausted, subhanAllah, the app has the feature to play those du'as. So you can listen to those du'as or you can ask someone to recite it for you, subhanAllah. And this is all part of ruqya, the treatment that Rasulullah used to do. He would recite these supplications and he he would blow it on the person who was sick. So we can do that, of course, right? And subhanAllah, of course, the gist of all this is the last point or subhanAllah, the, the umbrella in which we can sum up all the points inside, right, would be to stay patient and to treat others kindly and expect the reward from Allah subhanAllah. So inshallah, if we use all these five tools, then inshallah, we will utilize this time frame of illness to seek maximum ajr and avail this opportunity to gain nearness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of us. Um. So now that's the case if we fall sick. What's the case if we are the caretaker of someone who is sick? Even that is a beautiful opportunity to avail rewards. And we should never consider it as a burden on us. So we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we are someone's caretaker, we should again be patient and try our best to help them out, whether it's your parent who is sick, whether it's your sibling who is sick, whether it's your child, inshallah, in future, who is, um, you know, having a fever or he's going through a headache, right? Whoever it is, if you are a caretaker also, again, the rule of thumb is to be patient and expect the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and consider it as an opportunity to attain ajr as an opportunity to gain nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and do the best you can to make the sick person comfortable, inshallah, because there is so 
much ajr in it. There's so much ajr in it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the dearest of people to Allah is the one who does most benefit to people. And the dearest of deeds to Allah, may he be exalted, is joy that you bring to a Muslim. So either you benefit others or you make someone happy. Or relieving him of distress. So if he's going through any kind of distress, you help him to be relieved of it. Okay. Or paying off debt for him. So subhanAllah, if he is in debt, you can pay it off. Or dispelling his hunger. So if someone is hungry, you give them food, you feed them. And, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and to walk with a brother, to meet his needs, is dearer to me than observing i'tikaf in this mosque, meaning the mosque of Medina for a month. Meaning, to address the needs of other people is more dearer to me than just staying in the masjid and doing my own personal ibadah. Of course, ibadah has a lot of reward, definitely. But when we help out other people, subhanAllah, it is something which is also going to bring us a lot of rewards because that person is going to make dua for you. So inshallah, it's a win-win situation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help all of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us against calamities, against hardship and afflictions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if ever we are to go through a calamity, we are to face an affliction, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sabrun jameel so that we are able to reap the maximum ajr, the maximum reward. Allahumma ameen. With that said, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nash'ad wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma anis wa ahshafi fi qabri. Allahumma arhamni bil Qur'an al-azim. Waja اجعله لي اماما ونورا وهدى ورحمه اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت وارزقني تلاوته انا الليل وانا النهار واجعله لي حجه يا رب العالمين امين تمامين السلام عليكم ورحمه 